Welcome. We're honored to have you listen and participate in these dialogues produced by the Cora de Brazza Foundation. To learn more about the foundation and about how you can help us in our mission of unearthing untold stories of moral energy, please visit us at virtuesofpeace.com. There you can access show archives, show resources, visit our Etsy shop, and support us with a donation. Virtuesofpeace.com. Hello, and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May, and I am joined by Lauren Marshall. Hi. And very special guest joining us from London, the United Kingdom, Elizabeth Crawford. Hello. So this show is both an interview with Elizabeth Crawford, who is an amazing researcher on women's history. You'll learn more about her research in this show. So in addition to talking about Elizabeth and her research, which spans decades, actually, we're also going to focus on one of Elizabeth's finds, which is the last will and testament of nurse Catherine Pine. We'll talk about who she is in this show, and you'll learn about Elizabeth's research. She has published several books and has an amazing blog called Woman and Her Sphere. We hope to go for about an hour today, and as always, we have resources on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. Just click on the show resources page. We'll refer to them throughout the course of this discussion. So, Elizabeth, just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, first of all. Well, I came into uh, historical research in a rather roundabout way. I do have a degree in uh, politics and history, but uh, that was uh, a long time ago. And I may say that women didn't feature in the course of, uh, I think, possibly domestic servants. May Women domestic servants may have been covered in the economic history, but in the politics, there was no mention, although we were doing 20th century politics, never mentioned the suffrage movement, for instance. But uh, I've always been interested in uh, women's lives. I mean, who isn't if you're a woman? And uh, I mean, really, um, I uh, while I was doing my degree, I would be reading biographies. And it, it, this was so long ago that people were writing biographies who had 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 childhoods, in, say, in the 1880s. And in the yes, eighteen eighties, end of the nineteenth century, and that was particularly I found fascinating. Anyway, um, I left university. I worked for a, a publisher, an academic publisher, Cambridge University Press, and so I got to see quite a lot about publishing of history. And um, then, uh, after a while, I uh, had three children. And uh, I was working as a copy editor at home, so I never stopped working. So I was editing a wide range of books. But when the youngest one was about three or four, I thought I had to get back out in the world. And it so happened that I thought I would start up by going to book fairs and selling books. And uh, what should I sell but women's lives, uh, women's fiction, women's history. And that was really how I got started. And um, I did that. Uh, I mean, I've done that ever since, and that's getting about 40 years now. And uh, But along the way, I got very interested in the suffrage movement, which say this was, say, in the 1990s. There were monographs being written, but uh, there was sort of no um, specific uh, I information. I mean, there would be political uh, over reaching narratives or analysis, but who were these people, I thought. And I was, at the time, I would be buying and selling uh, uh, material, photographs, postcards, a whole range of material relating to the suffrage movement, and I had to research for my cataloguing to find out who people were. And I had a brainwave one day while sitting in a train, that's where the good ideas come, looking out of the window. I thought, what I need is a book where I could look up for these women. Then I thought, well, Perhaps I should do it. And I had no contact in publishing, uh, you know, really then. Um, but I was at a launch of somebody else's book, 
and uh, it's just like going to the top of a, um, a slide in the swimming pool. I thought, right, I'm going to mention this before I leave. So I was talking to a, the editor of this book that was being published, and I said I had this idea for a reference guide to the women's suffrage movement, and I had got a contract within a couple of weeks. I mean, it was quite amazing. Things like that don't really usually happen, as I know, because mm. I, you know, you can wait a ages to uh, to go through all the wheels of publishing but anyway um, that was in 1995 and it was published in 1999 and this was pre-internet so all my research had to be done by letter and telephone I mean it just seems amazing now I wrote to all the libraries and archives in the British Isles asking what they held on the uh, women's suffrage and I mean quite a lot to reply and I then travelled all around the country visiting these archives no internet you know no catalogues or anything that you could look at and uh, the result was this rather fat book which has got about 400 biographies of suffrage activists both militant and non-militant going from the mid 19th century 1866 as starting point um, right up to 1928 when all women in Britain did get the vote and um, so it's got all the biographies plus um, entries on all the societies and a whole range of other things like uh, oh, shops that they had and the ceramic figures that they made and the jewellery all this uh, as well and that was a starting point and I've been sort of uh, deep in suffrage ever since. Wow. So this is your first book is 1999. And what's the title of that it's book? It's The Women's Suffrage Movement, colon, A Reference Guide, 1866 to 1928. <laughs> That's awesome. And then I was asked, And so... As I, I was just going to say, the same publisher then asked me to do another uh, sort of parallel book, which was um, a regional survey. So it's The Women's Suffrage Movement, a regional survey, going around the country, showing how the suffrage movement developed in all the towns of the British Isles. Really. Amazing. So, and as I understand it, as part of this research, you're, you're going into archives and you're traveling around. <clears throat> you do purchase um, books of wills as part of your it, research process. It's not, Can you talk about yes, that? Yes, it's not actually books. What it is that um, people write their wills and they're all stored in a registry and you can order up the individual copies. So, I mean, it's I have the copy, you know, you've seen of uh, uh, Nurse Pine's will, which she, that's, you can see, she just did a hand-written uh, sheet. I mean, I think you buy the sheet at the stationers and you write it up. And um, most people uh, go through solicitors and have, it's rather more formal. Hers is extremely informal. And it was written, I think, just um, two weeks before she died, I worked out. Um, but uh, yes, so, I mean, it's a tedious process. You get the great, there are great books with all the um, information, you know, a few inches of uh, information about each one. And if you've no idea when someone died, you know, you just have to go through. Some of these women lived a very long time, so I couldn't believe, you know, 99, it, could she really be 99? <laughs> you know, just trying to track them down. But that was how it had to be done then. Now, with a click of a button, you do Ancestry or Find My Past, one of these genealogical sites, and uh, you can find them in seconds. But in my day, it was uh, uh, hard work. Right. And so do you, do you use, like, um, Ancestry and Find My Past oh, now oh, when you're doing your research? Yes. I mean, it's a godsend. Wonderful. And, uh, and they're adding to the records that they um, digitize all the time. So there's more and more material. And what, I mean, I, I've never, until you and I talked, I'd never heard about using the last will and testament of someone to, and if I recall, like you, you said, you know, when you find a good one, you, you can like see the, the network of mm -hmm. the person because their person is like giving things to their friends. I mean, what, is that just an instinct that you had or did you learn that in 
and university. Oh, to, no, gosh, no. Know. University never taught me anything about doing any kind of research whatsoever. <laughs> we were just given, we were just sort of spoon fed uh, whatever the lecturer said. There was no idea that you'd have personal involvement. I hope uh, things have changed by now. No, this was uh, my own. I've sort of got a detective brain, I like finding out things. So um, that was it. Um, and in fact, I think, I, I mean, I've got hundreds of these wills, um, great, I mean, a real heavy weight. Luckily, I was able to find this copy of Nurse Pine quite easily. They're supposedly better sized, but because I fish things out every now and again, they tend not to be. Um, but anyway, uh, no, it was, it was, I suppose, an instinct. But once I realize how, how good they could be. I mean, some are disappointing, but uh, um, uh, a lot uh, went into great details, not only about the people they were giving um, their uh, worldly goods to, uh, but what those worldly goods were. You know, it'd be interesting. You, you could see, uh, you know, a picture of Garibaldi or, uh, uh, or I don't know, a whole range of things, and you could see sort of political affiliations through the as we now say, material culture. Fascinating. Lauren, do you have any questions before we move on to Nurse Pine's actual, we've mentioned Nurse Pine briefly, but we're going to be moving to her specific will in a minute. Any questions? No, no questions. I'm just absolutely amazed by the research pro like process and everything. Mm -hmm. It's truly so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially before the internet and now using ancestry and things like that. I had never thought about it in a research way. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So, yes, the topic, as I, as I said in the beginning, this is a part interview, part philosophical discussion. You've learned a little bit about Elizabeth and her background, how she got into women's history, how she really pioneered, you know, like, like nothing existed. So you made it. You made this book, um, this reference guide. As you've discussed, you've briefly mentioned the last will and testament of nurse Catherine Pine, and we're going to be focused on that specific will and that specific person. Nurse Catherine Pine was born in 1864, and she died in 1941, and she is one of the wills that you have uncovered in your research, Elizabeth. And can you tell the audience just a little bit more about Nurse Catherine Pine? Yes, she was uh, one of uh, many children, uh, there seemed to be mainly girls, I think, of a, um, a, a farmer, I think a small-time farmer, um, also described as a corn factor. I mean, anyway, something to do with agriculture in Kent, in the south of England. And so it would be... Um, you know, not a well. I mean, not a not a poor family, but by no means well off. And um, I don't know anything about her education or what she did until she went for her nurse's training at St Bartholomew's Hospital in London, which is one of the really big um, London hospitals with a training school for for nurses. And I think she, I think she went there in. 1895. So she was really about 30 years old when she um, actually um, did that. I don't know whether she'd had any um, paid work before. I rather suspect not. It may well be about the time that her father died and she realised, you know, had to earn a living. Anyway, she trained as a nurse uh, there. And then by uh, 1905, so um, 10 years later, she was running a nursing home um, in uh, an area of West London, so central London. I mean, it's an area now that's so incredibly wealthy. You can dream of using a house for a nursing home uh, there, there now. But she did it. She set up with a friend, uh, also a nurse who was a bit younger than her, called Gertrude Townend. And um, I think it was... They probably had joined the Women's Social and Political Union. Now, this is the organisation that was founded by Mrs Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel to be militant suffrage um, because the suffrage campaign up until then had been very um, 
what we describe it as constitutional. They had done all the um, the correct ways of trying to influence Parliament. Um, they'd been doing that for 30, 40 years and had really not got anywhere very much. And Mrs Pankhurst um, decided that they were going to be more vocal. As it started off, it became uh, more physical as well as vocal in due course. But anyway, I think uh, um, Nurse Pine and uh, Gertrude Townend had probably joined the WSPU quite early on in London, perhaps about 1907. But certainly by 1908, um, they were nursing Mrs Pankhurst's son. She had three uh, daughters and she'd had one son who died as a child. And this other son was in his late teens and he, he was... Well, the girls were very hearty and uh, and strong. He was rather weak, I think, probably, um, uh, you know, just... Uh, uh, anyway, he had various things wrong with him and then he developed polio and he was taken uh, to Nurse Pine's nursing home and uh, he actually died there um, in 1910. I mean, and um, by this time... I think uh, Pankhurst were, Mrs. Pankhurst was very reliant on uh, on Nurse Pine for just general sort of support. I imagine Nurse Pine was a very sensible and um, you know straightforward person, and was probably quite uh, um, somebody Mrs. Pankhurst could rely on. Anyway, and um, that, so 1910, then um, slowly the the suffrage movement was getting, as I say, much more physical and uh, women were being arrested and they were being sent to prison and then the hunger striking started and Nurse Pine's nursing home was then used um, for uh, prisoners to recuperate in uh, once they came out of prison. And by 1913, I mean, the whole thing was really getting completely out of hand. It was very... Uh, um, really pretty disastrous the whole situation and the government had imposed a, a, a new law that um, suffragettes could be released on hunger striking uh, to recover their health but they were then supposed to go back into prison once they were deemed fit and uh, Nurse Pine's uh, nursing home was besieged uh, by <laughs> police quite a lot of the time because these women would be uh, wanting to escape Anyway, Mrs. Pankhurst uh, was going, uh, had been arrested in the spring of uh, 1913 on a charge of having uh, uh, been responsible. Not directly, she hadn't actually um, set the bomb herself, but it uh, was a bomb went off in the house that was being built for a government minister. And this was considered so serious that the Home Office really felt they had to deal with her and so she was arrested and she went on hunger strike but the government never felt able to forcibly feed her because that was just sort of step too too far but she would go on hunger strike and then she'd be released and that was in always into Nurse Pine's care and um, this went on right through 1913 and 1914 right up until the outbreak of war. Heaven knows what would have happened if they hadn't been saved by uh, the declaration of war because um, things were really falling apart um, by then. Anyway, so Nurse Pine uh, was there um, uh, being a chief nurse to uh, the leader of the militant suffrage movement. Amazing. And... You've mentioned before, just for our listeners who may not know anything about any suffrage movement, I and mean, we're talking about the British suffrage movement and earlier and just before you used this distinction between, you know, the militant and non-militant. I think that's a very unfortunate word because um, there's no violence done towards persons, particularly. It's really the the Women's Social and Political Union, which was one of several suffrage organizations in the United Kingdom. So there's also the Women's Freedom League, um, but they 
WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, as you said, got more vocal and more physical. But and correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding that it's it's against pri like it's against property, not persons. Yes, in, in, indeed it is. Yeah, that's quite correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did of yes. course come into contact with the police. <laughs> But it was the women tend to become the worst of uh, those encounters. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, in terms of the the crimes for which Emmeline and other suffragettes, as they're called, were prosecuted, I think the main one was something called the Malicious Destruction of Property Act. Yes. And that they were, um, there was like a, several trials for conspiracy, like it was this whole network conspiring to violate the, quote, malicious destruction of property act. Yeah. And, and in uh, fact, I mean, that was the result of concentrated um, uh, attempts, well, more than attempts. Um, what the suffragettes did was um, in March, say, uh, 1912, um, they would uh, organize a large number of them uh, to descend on the main shopping streets in London and with hammers and stones break the windows of the shops. They would then stand there to be arrested because the whole point was to be arrested. It was to raise the profile of the movement. They would be photographers there to take uh, photographs of the broken windows and the women being arrested. It would make front page news. That was the point. Right. And I, I mean, I look at this as why like this, this adjective militant kind of frustrates me because I see this as a really nonviolent movement, which is designed to attract media attention, to raise consciousness of the public so that they express their outrage to the authorities. And so the, you know, the technique of doing these acts engaging in these acts and getting the media attention is very much used by the U.S. civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. and so forth. But it's these British suffragettes, the Women's Social and Political Union, who's, who's pioneering this uh, modern technique. So yes, just to, to make this distinction between militants and non-militants, and Nurse Pine, as you say, is like the nurse to these mil like militant women who are getting ar arrested, going on hunger strikes, and then she's nursing them back to health. So you have Nurse Catherine Pine's will. Now we know a little bit about her. Let's talk about the will that you have discovered. Um, but bef but first, like you, you knew about Nurse Pine before you read her will. I oh, yes, yes. I mean, I knew yeah. about it, which is why I was going to find her will, just like I was looking for everybody else's wills. And did you know about her because you were researching the Pankhursts? Oh, no, this was just, well, there's another, well, it's sort of um, chicken and the egg. I was particularly interested in her because of the other, um, the, the two bequests in the will, which we're particularly interested in. One, the medal that we'll come on to, but the other one was her books and photographs that she says she's leaving. Is that all right to discuss now? Why not? At this stage? <laughs> yeah. Um, she says she's leaving them to what she describes as the Women's Social and Political Union Club, I think she calls it. And <clears throat> that, I mean, that uh, bequest uh, was very effective, and it's now all her photographs and uh, postcards and uh, books are held in the Museum of London, which is very near me here in central central London. And because um, the Women's Social and Political Union Club became what was known as the Suffragette Fellowship, which was uh, through the 20, 1920s and 30s, women who had taken part in the militant suffrage uh, movement were particularly keen that the, their, their efforts shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, in fact, they should be uh, memorialized and um, they would um, give uh, items in their, they'd um, still, it was, they had still had 
um, a whole range of materials, both paper and medals and uh, badges and things they gave them to the Suffragette Fellowship. And uh, it, it eventually became a small museum in Kensington in London. And when they became too old in, I think, the 1950s, the material was all passed over to the Museum of London, which was, um, in fact, very... I mean, I'm always interested in... It's not just the idea that you give it to that particular museum. It just so happened the museum was across the road. Um, the big London Museum was in Kensington Palace at that time. I mean, it's not there. It hasn't been there for a long time, but that was how the collection went there. So I knew about Nurse Pine because I was looking at her photographs okay there so she was somebody of interest so yes this um suffragette fellowship collection um i i will say also that has been microfilmed and i have been in that collection and it is it's amazing so just for our listeners if you're interested in the suffragette fellowship collection you don't necessarily have to go to london to to look at it and it's not enough years in the in the life to go through all of it um, but it's there on microfilm if you have a good library that can access these microfilms and has, of course, have microfilm readers in your library. Not all libraries do anymore. But so you knew about this collection and I, I assume you were going and looking through the collection. And do you remember like you learned about Nurse Pine through the collection, or you know that she had given some of her things to the collection. Just like, can you talk more about the details with that? Well, it's a, a long time ago now. I can't quite remember the order of things, but I would be looking at her photographs, so I certainly knew who she was, and she was somebody I was going to have an entry for in my reference guide. So I, okay. would, I was finding out details about her, and as usual, I would go and look for her will. Right. And then you realize, and we'll have you read this provision of her will that you've referred to, but then you realize, oh, so she like, she did leave, she left this stuff that I've been looking at in her will. And so, yes, so can yes. you read this? And, and by the way, for our, our listeners, you can access a nurse, Catherine Pineswell, um, deep bow to Elizabeth Crawford for allowing us to use it and sharing it with me some years ago. That is on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. You can see Nurse Catherine Pine's will in its entirety. And so Elizabeth, can you read that provision where she's leaving, as you said, these books and photographs, and then this medal? Yes. My suffrage books and photographs pertaining to the Votes for Women um, campaign, to the Women's Social and Political Club, if they if they want them. Uh, my suffragette medal to be sent to the history section of the British College of Nursing from Sister C.E. Pine, St. Bart's Hospital, London. Thank you so much. St. Bart's is the abbreviation that's known popularly at St. Bart's Holymuse Hospital. Yes, and this is all handwritten, as I say, and uh, two weeks before she died, but it's quite... Uh, it was quite a steady hand. Uh, but, um... mm -hmm. And this is the only provision in her will where she is leaving properties to entities. So if you read her will, you see that she has some money. She's leaving it to her nieces. She has a sewing machine. She has a gramophone. She has some clothing. And she's leaving most of her things to individuals. Gertrude Townend is one of them. But she does leave her suffrage memorabilia to these two entities. One is this Women's Social and Political Club that becomes the Suffragette Fellowship that you mentioned. And now the Suffragette Fellowship Collection held by the Museum of London, now on microfilm. And that's one entity, Women's Social and Political Club, and the other entity is this history section of the British College of Nursing. So these two entities, she's leaving suffrage books and photographs to the Women's Social and Political Club and her, quote, suffragette medal to this history section of the British College of Nursing. And I just wanna pause and have us 
in this conversation and those of you listening to make a distinction between bequests or gifts to individuals on the one hand versus gifts, bequests to entities on the other. When we give things to entities when we're alive, we use the firm, the term charitable giving. Like this is charity. For me to give money to a university to start, for example, a nursing program. And charity can be practiced during one's life. We get to witness the gift and we watch the extent to which our gift is being respected, uh, our plans are being respected. That's called an inter vivos gift, but that's very different from someone who gives something to an entity at death for a specific purpose, like educational purpose or cure cancer, what have you, because the testator, the giver, is not there to witness whether or not the actual bequest is being respected. So um, I've, I've written on this thanks to Elizabeth's research, um, and I use this term value bequest is a term that we should use to think of Pine's bequest to these two entities, the Women's Social and Political Club and this history section of the British College of Nursing. She's doing this at death, leaving her property to entities for some, I would say, educational purpose. Um, and so you've mentioned, Elizabeth, this first item, the suffrage books and papers, that indeed, like, that part of her will was respected because you've been in that collection. And um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it, turn it over to you, Elizabeth, for anything you want to add to whatever I've said about value bequests and this this gift to the, to the Women's Social and Political Club. No, you've summed it up beautifully. <laughs> Nothing to add at all. Okay, and Lauren, do you have any any questions or observations? No, it makes complete sense to me. Okay, so. great. The Women's Social and Political Club, just again, that became the Suffragette Fellowship, which was this collection of memorabilia, really. And um, having been in the collection, I've, I've uh, seen some documents where they say we need to celebrate certain dates. So like Emmeline Pankhurst's birthday, we need to have a, a talk. And so there's this, I call it, you know, this memory work or practicing the art of memory and this commemoration. And this was really important to the suffragette fellowship using these objects in connection with meaningful dates in the movement. Do you want to say anything more about that, Elizabeth? No, that's uh, that's just right. Yes, and they uh, um, carried on long after Mrs. Pankhurst had died. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. but, um, and they'd have um, there was a statue erected to her just by the House of Parliament, and they would go along with flowers and you know make a thing of it and get a photographer to come along, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it was all part of the memorialising. So important, and I know that when that statute of Emmeline Pankhurst was unveiled, that Nurse Catherine Pine was there, and we'll say we'll say some more yes. about that. But um, so this other mm -hmm. value bequest. So we have the suffrage books and photographs. They made it. Elizabeth's there to verify, <laughs> like yes, um, Catherine Pine's <laughs> books and papers um, made it to their destination, and. Um, the suffragette medal, let's focus on that. Um, so she leaves us to the history section of the British College of Nursing. Can you talk more about that, Elizabeth? The history section of the British College well, of Nursing. Yes. Um, the nursing uh, world in the uh, 19, uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, I, it's not my specialist subject, but it seemed to be riven into two camps that I'm not entirely clear what the uh, Casas Belli was, why they were. I think personalities, I think, came into it. Anyway, the British College, uh, there was an, one that became the Royal College of Nursing, 
uh, which is still with us, but there was this offshoot, the British College of Nursing, that was set up by a woman called Mrs. Ethel Fenwick. And I think she was a strong personality and wanted her own college. I, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, um, Nurse Pine was obviously an adherent of Mrs. Fenwick and, uh, um, and the British College of Nursing. And uh, it... Um, uh, didn't long survive. I'm not quite can't quite remember when Mrs. Fenwick died, but uh, as we know, as we find out, by the mid 1950s, um, it was running short of funds and uh, eventually collapsed. Mm-hmm. And do you know what this? But it did obviously have this history section. Right. Was um, it, it obviously? Uh, and, because it doesn't exist and there's no catalogue of it or anything, we don't know what's in it. What we know is what isn't in it, which is Nurse Pine's Medal and a couple of other things that were given by another suffragette that um, uh, disappeared and have surfaced. Um, but uh, what else was there? We don't know. But things that were supposed to be uplifting, I think, uh, for, for nurses, education in a way, yeah. Indeed. I, I think that the history section of the British College of Nursing was a kind of analog, analog to what became the Suffragette Fellowship Collection. There was this memorabilia, mm-hmm. there was a very large collection of, they called it Nightingaleana. So like these relics from Florence Nightingale, um, Florence Nightingale's carriage and you know, all these things from Florence, mm-hmm. little statues and and uh, I think some of this material must have gone to the Florence Nightingale Museum, which is which is in London. But mm-hmm. there is, um, you know, the, this journal, which is online. And if you read uh, various issues from this this time period before Nurse Pine dies, after Nurse Pine dies, you'll see them talking about this history section. And there's, you know, an administrator, and they're doing reports, and like, oh, we just got, the, you know, from the history section, just got this letter of Florence Nightingale. It's now in our collection, and I think they would bring it, bring this memorabilia out from time to time to educate not just nurses but others on the quote history of nursing and so pine leaves her suffragette medal to this history section of the british college of nursing now when she says suffragette medal um, that's kind of broad because there were different medals and um, there was at least the holloway medal and the hunger strike suffragette medal can you say more about these different medals elizabeth yes um they were they were medals were really again more consciousness raising really um and it's they started off with the what's called in fact the holloway brooch it's and it's not usually called a medal it's a, a brooch and it's in the shape of a, a portcullis which is the symbol of the houses of parliament but superimposed on that is a convict's arrow in the purple, white, and green colours and enamel on the silver brooch. So it's a very neat little thing um, with two chains hanging off uh, the sides. Um, And those were first um, given in 1909, I think. I've just been writing about it, in fact. Um, And uh, yes, it was April 1909. In in London uh, was being held... uh, uh, conference of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, which was held every four years, and this year it was going to be held in 1909, was held in London, and it was the constitutionalists uh, on the whole uh, were running this um, with the um, international delegates. They, the international delegates were sort of affiliated to the constitutional movement, and the militant was slightly out on a limb so they decided to do uh, you know have a big publicity thing and they took over the Albert Hall one of these big halls in the central uh, London for uh, a meeting and invited delegates there and on the platform they assembled a whole load of um, prisoners uh, women who had been in prison to be presented with for the first time this Holloway brooch 
and uh, then the, there were some women who were in prison at that very time who were being released the next day on the Friday. So they repeated it all again uh, the next day and uh, in the evening. And there was a lot of uh, publicity, at least in the suffrage movement, there was a lot of publicity about it. And um, so that was the first thing. But then as women then went on hunger strike in prison, they obviously thought there should be something uh, even more remarkable given to them. And in the rather like a Victoria Cross, which is the highest uh, um, honour in the uh, in the British Army for um, oh, some act of glory, uh, they devised the um, Hunger Strike Medal. And that medal says for valour and uh, has a, a pendant um, saying Hunger Strike and then with the name of the um, prisoner on the, the back and then a date of uh, of the, the imprisonment. And to that were added bars when women suffered subsequent imprisonment. So they can be quite impressive. And they're all hanging on a purple, white and green um, pendant uh, ribbon. So it's very like a military honour. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these were awarded. But uh, so the, the point is, <laughs> Nurse Pine didn't go to prison and she didn't go on hunger strike. So what was her suffragette medal? Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, yeah, there is a suffragette medal. She leads it to the history section of the British College of Nurses. And um, what is this thing? And we'll talk about that, but what you do when you learn about this. But um, what do you what do you think her intent was in leaving this medal to the history section of the British College of Nursing? Why is Pine doing this? Well, she wants to um, keep the suffragette flame alive, I suppose, and show the part that nursing played in the suffragette movement particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was one of her, her prized possessions. Uh, and she was leaving it to her the college that uh, she was most closely associated with. And she specifically says that it's from Sister C.E. Pine, St. Bart's Hospital. So she's uh, um, acting as an, in her nursing capacity, as it were, uh, although she was long since retired. But uh... Indeed, um, as we mentioned when we were talking about the Suffragette Fellowship Collection, and you mentioned that they would do these events and go to Emmeline Pankhurst's statue and lay flowers and so forth. And I said, you know, when that statue was unveiled, and I think it's 1930, it's unveiled. Um, mm. Nurse Pine is there and she's wearing her medal. There's um, an article, like an article in this yeah. journal of the British College of Nursing, which tells the story. And this is 1930 and she said, she's wearing this medal and she says, I'm going to give this to you when I die. Now, this is in 1930. So 11 years, like this was something very important for her because over a decade before she dies, she communicates that with the British College of Nursing. And I think they're probably like, great, because if you contrast the language, the books and photographs to the Women's Social and Political Club, if they want them, and that's very specific mm -hmm. legal language that's called precatory. I'm sorry, but it's just, it's, it's not definitive. It's like, if they want it, they can have it. But if they don't, yeah, I don't know what. But like that if clause mm -hmm. means like, well, it doesn't suggest that it's in, as important as the metal because there's no precatory language. It's like, this is going mm -hmm. to the history section from Sister Pine. And indeed, this was extremely, I would say it's more important to her than the books and photographs because it doesn't have that precatory language. So there it is. We don't know what this medal is. We know a little bit now about the history section. And you said, Elizabeth, that um, it's not there. But do you know if the history section ever received Pine's suffragette medal? Did they ever get it? Do you know? Yes, we know. We know it is because it was recorded in the 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 
college's uh, newsletter uh, journal that you mentioned. Yes. Yes, it specifically says, and they're, they're very pleased to have it. Yes. The article that that is described in is, it's called something like, the title is, A Worldwide Gift to Women, which I love. Mm-hmm. So they don't see it as mm-hmm. just, this is just for the history section of the British College of Nurses. This is a gift for all women. Um, and so, yes, they, they do get it. They report it. Um, you've mentioned that the British College of Nurses is no longer in existence. Therefore, the history section is no longer in existence. So do you know what happened to like their holdings? Well, we know that the building, which was in, called Queen, in Queensgate, which is in Kensington again, we know that that was sold. We know that before it was sold, the contents were valued by Harrods, the big store they had valuers in. And there's this rather sad clause that says in the report um, at the AGM, it says that if any fellow or member is interested in anything in the building, then they can buy them at the value that Harrods placed on them. So I imagine that includes the history section. Right. And that's not kosher because this is a charity and like that we're, we're getting into some other weeds, but you know, the British College of Nurses is a public charity and the UK Charity Commission comes in and says, whoa, 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 you can't just like be selling this. Um, but I mean, some of the holdings do go to some archives, no? Like that the, um, some archives in London, yes? Yes, King's College London has uh, a lot of the uh, paper archives, Mm -hmm. um, but have no artifacts as as such. Nothing that we could think would come from the history section. Is that right? I think they do have some ribbons and medals and so forth. Um, Yes, so they they may Mm. not have Pines medal, but they do have some other medals, ribbons, and at least that's... That's what I can gather from, you know, Mount Pleasant, Michigan, um, looking at finding aids and Mm -hmm. so forth. Um, But clearly, like, so this is, you know, part, we're getting, we're getting to the meat of the story. But just to sum up again, so (laughs) Nurse Pine leaves her suffragette medal to the history section of the British College of Nursing. They go under, when they're going under, they say, hey, guys, if you want to buy anything, Harrods has priced evaluation, you can do so. The UK Charity Commission says you can't do that because this is a public charity. This is not for private ownership. This is for a charitable purpose. This whole entity exists for, yes. Somebody somebody must have stepped in and alerted the Charity Commission then, presumably. I don't suppose they would have known otherwise. Do you think? I I mean... (laughs) I, yeah, we're, as you know, we're researching this now. <laughs> we're like in the process of like yeah. in the weeds of these these archives. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a stay tuned for podcast number two on on um, what, what exactly <laughs> Harrods does, because that was sort of like where where you and I were time. Time is running out. Um, but but mm-hmm. the short story is some stuff made it to King's College, London. So if, if I want to see the archives of the History College, some of it at any rate, I'm going to go to King's College, London. Um, but as we'll, we'll say, Pine's Medal is not there. So after you read Pine's will, Elizabeth, and you read the stuff about her suffrage memorabilia and specifically about the suffragette medal, we'll call that the suffragette medal provision of her will, Um, Can you talk about what you did after you read that provision? Well, it was only about uh, 16 years later, was it? uh, (laughs) For some reason, I can't remember now why (laughs) it came to me. I I thought, you know, because in the entry on uh, her in the reference guide, I just mentioned this. But uh, at some point, uh, I had obviously thought, I wonder what this medal was and that was about 2016 I think I wrote that yes, blog which is full of suppositions because you found out far more about the the um, 
uh, auctions they'd been. I hadn't uh, uncovered that uh, that stage. I uh, just wondered whatever this medal could have been because I knew she hadn't been on hunger strike and, uh, um, you know, what kind of medal had they given her? So it was a rather, mm -hmm. um, it's full of supposition, my little blog on that. And that's when you saw it and uh, then got down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> yes. So that's right. Um, and this blog post that Elizabeth is referring to, which is titled The Mystery of Nurse Pines Metal, is on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. Yes, you write that in May 2016. And you, you reach out, as I understand it, you reach out to King's College. You ask them, do you have this medal? And they say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. And, and you, you tell that story. So there's really two parts to this, at least two parts to this mystery of Nurse Pine's medal, as you call it. There's, you know, like, well, where is it? Um, and how did it go missing? Because it's not where it's supposed to be, unlike her books and photographs. And the other part that you're talking about is, well, what is this medal? So where is it? What happened to it? And what exactly is it? Is it a hunger strike medal? Is it one of Emmeline Pankhurst's medal? What does this thing look like? So part two, that's the, what does it look like is we call that part two of the mystery. And part two of the mystery has been solved. We know what it looks like. So if you fast forward to 2021, so Elizabeth writes this blog post in 2016, fast forward to 2021, five years later, and I am knee deep in hunger strike metal research, in the weeds of hunger strike metal research, because I am making replicas of hunger strike metals, one for Constance Lytton, one for Alice Paul. There should be like a whole like, <laughs> but the, the short story is I'm in the weeds. And because I'm in the weeds, I have read Elizabeth's blog post from 2016. And I have also read um, a newspaper article from 1990, which uh, reports that this Nurse Pines medal is coming up for auction. Now, this is in 1990. I'm like in British newspaper archives, and I'm doing word searches for like, it's not hunger strike medal because they don't call it that. They call that, that medal the medal for valor. Later, it gets this phrase, hunger strike medal. So I'm doing... And I, I learned that in my research, and um, I see this um, this long medal in a picture, and I, I read Elizabeth, and I'm like, I, I think I've seen this thing. I think I've seen this medal. And, um, and so I do my own research and uh, realize it's, it goes up for auction in 1990. Nobody buys it. It then goes up for auction again in 2008, and someone buys it. It sells. And uh, I contact Elizabeth, and that's when you, like, you and I first meet over this. Um, and I want to say, like, the reason why I'm making these replicas, so as you know, Elizabeth, like, actual hunger strike medals are collector's item, and they sell for the equivalent of, like, 20000 25000 U.S. dollars. They are, they are precious items, and some museums have them. And um, in the United States, we know very little about this history, sadly. And if people in the United States are taught about the suffrage movement, they're taught about the U.S. movement, and specifically under Alice Paul, through a film called Iron Jawed Angels, which was made from a book by the same title, Iron Jawed Angels by Linda Ford. That book was 1991. And the film Iron Jawed Angels barely mentions, it's like a very quick reference to the Women's Social and Political Union, where Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, they, they're like, they're, they've been like hanging out with hooligans or something like this. And um, that's, that's, the, that, that's the extent of it. Um, I did read the book Iron Jawed Angels, and in that book, um, there's a reference to Shoulder to Shoulder, which is this BBC miniseries, I think from 1974, which would mean that this is the 50th anniversary of that, first episode of which is linked on the show resources page. We leave it to you to follow the and find the other five episodes. But uh, 
After reading Iron Jawed Angels, I tracked down a VHS copy of Shoulder to Shoulder. This is over a decade ago. And I was just blown away by this story. I mean, I learned about Constance Lytton in that story. Um, Nurse Pine appears in Shoulder to Shoulder. So this is older, over a decade ago. And um, fast forward to like 2021, I just feel like I need to, you know, that's the hundredth of the 19th Amendment in the United States. And I'm, I'm, I'm just like in the weeds of like women's history and the intersection between women's and peace history. And I realized the debt that U.S. women have to British women big time. And John Stuart Mill also, as well as be, he begins this process in England. Um, and I just, and, and Alice Paul trained with the Women's Social and Political Union. All of the things that she does in the United States, she learns from the Pankhurst, the visual spectacle, the pageantry, having colors, and the hunger striking, and the forcible feeding. Alice Paul is forcibly fed in two continents, both in England and the United States. And I feel like a medal needs to be made for her. So I make one and I make one for Constance Lytton because I just think that that story of Constance Lytton, topic for another show, but Google her if you don't know who she is. Uh, Constance Lytton, who was forcibly fed, went on hunger strikes and so forth. I'm making replicas of these things for the sake of teaching this indebtedness that the U.S. has to the British suffrage movement, but also to talk about this legacy of suffering and nonviolence on both sides. And, you know, the, the U.S. movement, Alice Paul, who was a Quaker, rejected any destruction to property. That's like sort of where it changes, where you have, she trains with the WSPU, who says we're going to have a war against the sacred idol of property. And Alice Paul says, we're not going to do that in the United States. This is just going to be a speaking truth to power. Um, it's it's militant in terms of it's bothersome for the Wilson administration, but there's no like destruction of property. If you've seen the film Iron Jawed Angels, you know that there's arrests, forcible feedings, but Alice Paul knew what to do. She had been trained by the Women's Social and Polit Political Union. So whatever, um, I'm making these medals. I I see Pine's medal. I, I read Elizabeth's blog and um, part two is you know, we know what Pine's Medal looks like, but it's not where it's supposed to be. I've said a lot right now, so I'm just going to stop and see if anybody has any questions or comments. Well, I'll just uh, say one thing, which uh, I've never touched on before, but today, I, for the first time, I did actually go carefully through the clasps on the medal, which, you know, have got dates on um, uh, for each um, clasp has got a date. And I correlated it with, in my reference guide, I, uh, in my entry on Mrs. Pankhurst, I uh, had used all the Home Office papers, that's uh, um, the police and prison uh, papers that are held in our national archives. And I'd, uh, in that entry, I say exactly which day she's arrested, which day she's released from prison all through 1913 and 14. And I was delighted to say that all those dates correlate. So the engraved dates on the clasps are the dates that uh, Mrs. Pankhurst was released to Miss to Catherine Pine's care. So I think that's an interesting. I mean, one would expect it should be so, but it really does work. <laughs> it's a yes, history it's a book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do like, I, I've done that as well with these dates. And um, I remember... <laughs> we had a brief correspondence about this because this very first date on the medal is March 29th, oh, 1913. Yes. That's the only one and, I, um, I, I didn't have, yeah. Sylvia Pankhurst is cared for at that time. Oh, really? um, yeah. So Sylvia yeah. Pankhurst was the only Pankhurst to be forcibly fed. And yeah. she was clearly, um, and we, we can do a show on her. If you watch Shoulder mm -hmm. to Shoulder, the mini series, um, you'll see that they break over World War I. Um, and Sylvia is really committed to like no violence, physical violence, and she does not support uh, the allyship with the UK in, in World War I. 
but she is forcibly fed, and that date hooks up with Nurse Pines okay. caring for yeah. Sylvia Pankhurst. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, yeah, that's just, I, I look at this medal as, it's a book, and so yeah, each of these dates is is a story that needs to be told and understood, and I think, um, of course, and Nurse Pine knew like that. And she wasn't actually even, she wasn't caring for Mrs. Pankhurst anyway, uh, in her nursing home, in fact. Um, it was at various houses around, in and around London, because the nursing yes. home was being besieged by the police. Yeah. Yes. And um, um, they go to, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the other woman's home. Um, Ethel Snyder. Where they were. No, Hertha Ayrton. Hertha Ayrton's Which house? one? Hertha Ayrton. Yeah, there's, there's um, Ethel Smyze, but there's um, another one that's still in London. Um, uh, and it's a family Hertha, of, of uh, women. Which one? Oh, the Brackenberries then. Yes, that's uh, it. The Brackenberries. Yes, Correct. Yes. Hilda Brackenberry yeah. and um, yeah. her. And so that's another. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. they're, they're, they're on the lamb, if you will, and, and, and running yeah. like um, from, from house to house. So, incredible story. It's, why we're here talking about it and it's also why i felt compelled to make these replicas which i will say do sell and they sell to people in england and they sell to people in the united states it's, i'm always amazed at who's buying it and why um and so i'm happy to be like getting out the story in the in this way um so let's we've been going for an hour and let's um try in like the next 15 minutes to just raise some philosophical questions. We can think about them. We ask our audience to think about them. But um, we know that in 1990 and 2008, Nurse Pine's medal, somehow, we don't know like what happens to it. We don't know how it leaves the history section and ends up in an auction house. We just don't know that yet. Maybe we will someday. But we know now that it's not supposed to be <laughs> auctioned. Um, do, and so is that, do you think, what, what do you guys think about that? Like, is that proper for an auction house? Now that like Elizabeth has uncovered, okay, here's Nurse Pine's will. It says this is to be given to this entity for a an educational purpose. Um, what do you guys think about this going up for, for auction into someone's private collection, maybe? Well, I don't think auction houses uh, are that interesting. No, it was 1990 uh, that uh, auction, say, would take that one. Well, that's um, 40, 50 years after the disbandment of uh, the British College of Nursing. I mean, I, I don't suppose the auction house uh, queried ownership at all. I don't know who, of course, we don't know who owned it, uh, how they, no, I don't think they have to say where they got it. I mean, it would be just, I've, I've not a great, very high opinion of auction houses. But actually, perhaps, perhaps you better cut that out. <laughs> yeah. So, like, because of, um, like, looted Nazi art and so forth, <laughs> There's a whole movement, um, and it's called like the due diligence movement for auction houses. And so they are supposed to, if they, they get some very rare thing, they are supposed to exercise due diligence. And there's now, at least for, for artwork, as well as watches, there are these registers. Um, I think both companies uh, who do this are in England. And um, if something is missing, you know, you're supposed to register in this database and then an auction house is supposed to look up and match its I think that does work. Property that against that. I think it works if, if uh, things have actually been, you know, known to be stolen uh, in the you know, right. conventional sense. Yeah. Right. And so it raises, this is the, the philosophical question. This is, um, as you know, Elizabeth, I, I'm... I have this paper on this and I've, I've given a talk on, on this um, that, well, when we have a will that has a value bequest, I mean, should that, should there be a register for, for that kind of thing? So it's, we don't know whether it's stolen or not, but should there be some sort of like, yeah, database of these so-called value bequests 
Um, and that's one way to address if we think that there's harm going on. Um, Lauren, do you have anything to say about, about this? Um, yeah, I just have a question. Um, so what happens if the entity that these things are yeah, given to uh, doesn't want it? Yeah. Even though it's... So, listed- so that's a, it's a superb right. question. So one answer is, whatever the answer that is, it doesn't apply to Pine's case because they wanted it. They knew since 1930 that she was going to give them. They were like, right. But if it doesn't want it, yeah, right, exactly. so um, that's why it is, if you want to leave a value bequest, you really have some work to do and like make contact with the entity and say, I have a rock collection and like, will you accept my rock collection? And they may say no. So us, I, I, I personally am moved by this story because women and property are a relatively new thing, if you will. Um, women accumulating property and then intentionally leaving it to serve some sort of social purpose. Um, And so I think this is actually part of one's autonomy. And I think that this is part of one's, like I call it the self-presentation aspect of one's autonomy. Our autonomy includes how we present ourselves to the world. So like there are all these like coming out narratives and forcible outings. Like maybe someone's not ready to like display this part of their identity to the public. So I think that one's last will and testament is like the final, like the the final note and the song of one's life. It's like the the exiting of the stage of life. And I can appear and I can appear to give all of my stuff to my friends or I can appear to, I'm going to leave all my stuff to cure cancer. It says something about that person's identity. And I think that we have to really take last wills and testaments seriously. And if you're going to leave a value bequest, you need to do your diligence. Does a, a museum have the duty to accept my rock collection? No, it doesn't. Okay. Like it doesn't have any space. So this is something for us to all be thinking about as we, because all of us are going to disappear. Um, this Hannah Arendt's phrase. And how you disappear, you need to put some thought into it because it's part of your autonomy. But it's a great question. Um, another question is, well, what happens if I say, okay, Central Michigan University, will you accept my books and papers? And they say, yes. Well, what if Central Michigan University goes under? What if it stops existing? Then what happens? There is law in place in England and in the United States that because I leave this for a charitable purpose, books and papers to Central Michigan University, the duty of the state is to make sure that that property goes to something as similar as possible. It's called the sea prey. That's in French, by the way, not in English. <laughs> See, prey doctrine means as near as possible. So the goal is always to capture the testator's intent as closely as possible. So if my intent is to leave this to Central Michigan University for educational purposes, Central Michigan University goes under, then the state has a duty to make sure that the property goes to something as near as possible. So probably like another public institution in Michigan. Because this this question is because the British College of Nursing goes under, so like what like then what happens to this property? And it's the duty of the state to really look at its holdings and say, are any of these things value bequests? And if so, like what does the will say, and how do I get this to where it's supposed to go as close as possible? Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Well, just a little uh, uh, as an aside, really. This so happened uh, earlier this year. The, there was a move, um, uh, some kind of uh, consultation exercise by the uh, organization in charge of wills to say that um, perhaps we will only hold them for 20 years and then we'll destroy them, except for people who are known to be important. And there's been a great about that but you can see <laughs> there'd be no way of choosing. wow <laughs> anyway right so the, the, these these are the philosophical questions and if you're listening you're probably thinking of more and um we've been going for a little bit over an hour and our our goal was to like yeah just because you know it's it's evening time in in london and 
Elizabeth has a, a duck in the oven and so forth. In the oven, yes, I <laughs> needs to be turned yes. over. Yes. Um, so I'll just ask one last question and then we'll go around and like, we'll, we'll answer this question and then just summation and then we'll call it, we'll call it a, a day slash evening. So there's a real question, especially this recent thing that you just mentioned, Elizabeth, about we'll only hold wills for 20 years and so forth. And the question in philosophy, this... They, be, they were going to be... Sorry, I, I must say, they were going to be digitized, okay. but then the real, the hard copies would be destroyed. And we know, I don't know if you know about the cyber attack on the British Library. Have you I heard have about not. that? Please educate us. No, well, the British Library at the moment is paralyzed and has been since uh, the end of October by a cyber attack. You can't access the great majority of the holdings. You know, that's digitization yeah, right. <laughs> for you. Anyway. No, I love it. I, I, I love talk. it. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so the hard copy is extremely important. Um, Indeed. And we, we, we can have a, a, another show about that. Now, in philosophy, there's a philosophical discussion, and it's called, you know, the debate about posthumous harm. Posthumous meaning, you know, after one has d died. So can the dead be harmed? That's the question. And some people in philosophy say yes. And some people say, well, no, they're dead. How can you harm the dead? And so forth. And so I don't know if you guys want to answer that question. I just am raising it at the end. And especially as we talk about wills and respecting one's final wishes. Um, so if I don't respect one's final wishes, what's the big deal? I mean, the person's dead. Um, are they being harmed? Are we being harmed? What's the harm being done is the question. And Elizabeth, I'll start with you, if you have any thoughts about that, and then I'll move to, to Lauren. Well, I, I think you are harmed if your wishes aren't uh, being carried out, yes, but I, I have no philosophical uh, uh, ability whatsoever. It's Your just, gut says yes. Just a gut feeling. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Lauren? Yeah, I would say I agree. It's a disservice to the dead, but also to us. Mm because it's almost a comfort to the yes. people alive that our wishes will be upheld after we pass. And so I think it says more about the society mm -hmm. than necessarily to the dead specifically, but I think it's important to uphold that. Yes, and I think both are harmed. And here's my philosophical bumper sticker, because I, you know, there's a whole paper on it. But if we think, if we go back to autonomy, and we, we remember that autonomy has a self-presentation component, right? Like what I show to the public is my decision and it's part of my autonomy. And one's last will and testament, if there's a value bequest, like there's like that self-presentation aspect towards a value that I'm trying to represent myself as like I am here to work for the cure of cancer or I am here working for women's history when I go out like I'm re like that's what this thing stands for that is part of my or the self-presentation aspect of one's autonomy that's nurse pine she's like when she goes out she wants suffragette fellowship history of nursing that is extremely important to her and when we dishonor that we dishonor the whole project of autonomy so that person's self-display and as you say lauren also we're dishonoring the society because we're less than like when we don't have you know these materials we're less than we're less able to learn about these important stories we're we're our inheritance of value is impoverished so people, when they leave the stage of life, some people try to contribute to, you know, this whole storehouse of value. And when we don't honor that, 
the next generation is like le is left with an impoverished inheritance, if that makes sense. So both harms are being done, and um, I'll I'll be quiet, and then I'll just ask for like final thoughts, because <laughs> now it's an hour and sixteen minutes, and we take time very seriously here. And so I'll begin with with you, Lauren, if you have uh, last thoughts, and then um, I'll ask Elizabeth to close out our session today. Lauren, go ahead first. No, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I've learned a lot today. <laughs> I'm very grateful that I got to be here. So thank you. Yes, thank you. You are the the next generation of coming up, and we, Elizabeth and I, if I might speak for you, Elizabeth, like we we work hard and like excavating and transmitting stories to the next generation because we ourselves have been extremely nourished by them. Uh, I'm speaking well, for you, Elizabeth. Absolutely. Just assuming I you mean, have been. In fact, <laughs> at each stage of uh, life as one goes through, when you read all the biographies of women, this, when you realize, you know, everybody's been through all this again before you, before you, you know, it's all a great, great comfort, I found. Yes. And uh, I was going to say, as a last um, thought, I mean, if you think of Nurse Pine there uh, lying in her nursing home uh, two weeks before she died with her pen in her hand, getting writing out her will on uh, this uh, sheet of stationery uh, from the just a ready-made, homemade will, and she'd uh, be devastated, I think, to think that... Uh, her medal uh, was lost, and uh, at least it wasn't being appreciated. Or at least not appreciated in the way that she intended, I suppose. I'm sure it is appreciated. Right. I, I think that's a such a powerful image to imagine her at the end of her life writing this. It's 1941. It's during World War II. Um, the, the blitz of London, I mean, the, the bombing. I mean, this is a very important thing to imagine and bring us back to. And the other thing is like the presence of mind that she has, because she tells the British College of Nursing in 1930, I'm going to leave this to you. And she remembers and re like honors that pledge and, and leaves it. And I, I think that, um, you know, when I, I, I gave a talk on this last year, last March, and talked about your work, Elizabeth, and someone someone asked, um, an, an undergraduate asked, like, why, why doesn't anybody, why did it take so long for us to realize that Nurse Pine's medal isn't where it's supposed to be? And I said, because people have to care. And I said, you know, Elizabeth Crawford had to care enough to read the will, to do the research of the will, to write a blog post on it. I mean, that just shows like this care. And so as we think about our own exits from the stage of life, remember like, even if you leave it to an institution, the people may not care there, but maybe there's someone else who cares, like a researcher. Um, but in the end, uh, we, we depend on people who care about autonomy and, and our dreams and visions and so forth and so thank you so much elizabeth for for caring to to write to, to to get the the will to write the blog to to respond to my emails to engage like have a conversation with me a couple years and to well, be here thank with you us for today. all the research wanna, uh, that like, uh, you've done uh, um into it i mean not just the legal and philosophical angles but, but uh, the actual uh, nitty-gritty of uh, finding uh, so much more. I'd uh, stopped in 2016 and hadn't looked any further. So uh, you've really brought it up to date. Oh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you got as far as you could go. <laughs> and, you know, there needs to be like other yeah. things come in. And it's this like making the metal, like it, it took someone who's like making the, making a replica of the metals and, and, and uh, in, in the, um, the home office records, which are, are digitized, I should say, and they're on, a f mm -hmm. on find my past. And they're amazing to go into like the yeah. home office records and seeing the medals being used in evidence by the prosecution. And I just got sort of wrapped up in 
and all of that. But it took me like it took like the I need to make replicas of these metals. It was like that was the decision. And then the, the proper research to get the dates right and everything. Um, so it's these decisions to like really care about these stories that are causing us to to come together and and um, dig up these things. And um, I think that's a any any last thoughts before I, I sign out for today? <laughs> Final thoughts. We've uh, we've covered the ground pretty pretty well. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, listeners. You've been listening to Virtues of Peace. Again, our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. This is Hope Elizabeth May signing off with Lauren Marshall and Elizabeth Crawford. Have a good evening, afternoon, and until next time. Bye-bye.